This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. The subject is Ingmar Bergman's film Persona. I will be discussing it with two experts, and the conversation will begin in a moment. The subject is Ingmar Bergman's film Persona and why it is a great film. I have two experts that will be talking about it. Uh, on screen, you will see Peter Olin. And just uh, coming in on audio, I'll have Robert Boyers. So let me start with uh, you, Peter. If you could give a little bit of background about yourself, as well as uh, a general overview of your opinion about uh, Bergman and the film Persona. Well, I... Yeah, go, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I, I grew up as part of the Bergman generation. Um, I, I grew up in Sweden, and consequently, <clears throat> Bergman was a big name, the young, fantastic director who broke some of the rules and uh, 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 was much maligned by the old conservative people, like my parents. But uh, 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 he spoke to the younger generation in a number of different ways. Uh, I left Sweden around the time that Bergman had his uh, religious crisis and, uh, um, and uh, with a trilogy. And, uh, but ever since the, the first Bergman film I ever saw was uh, um, the one that's, uh, oh, I can never remember titles, uh, Summer Games, it's called. Okay. Uh, and, uh, since then, I have seen every single one uh, of Burton's yeah. films, all those 40 films or whatever they are. And uh, they're part of my life, in a sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, have, I have periods when I love Bergman and have other periods when I uh, can't stand him. <laughs> uh, he, but... There's no doubt, though, that uh, um, he has had an influence on a whole generation of people and the way that they look at films. Mm -hmm. After Bergman, it was, became possible to make certain things in films, on film, that was not possible before. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he dared to take certain risks. He dared to make certain... Uh, uh, certain things that other people had not done. I mean, he shared some of that with people like Godard and Antonioni and all, that whole generation. But uh, uh, but there was a... Uh, nevertheless, it has been an ongoing influence on filmmaking from the, you know, the 19th 40s, 1950s onward, and that, that is an ex extraordinary achievement. I mean, um, I think whatever you think about Bergman, he has had uh, a remarkable influence. He's been a powerful presence in the way that we think about film. Mm. To put it simply, after Bergman, it became possible to think that film worked in a certain way that had not been possible before. Yeah. And, and that, I think, is a, is a real achievement, whether you like the films or not. Yeah. Uh, and I should say that Peter is uh, with McGill uh, University in Canada. Robert Boy is my next guest, uh, teaches at Skidmore, uh, and we only have him by audio. So, Robert, if you could just give a little bit of background about yourself and your opinion about Bergman in general and Persona specifically. Uh, sure. Um, well, uh, I, I came of age uh, in the 1960s um, in the wake of, uh, of Bergman's first uh, fame in the 1950s, where he you know, won the major international film awards uh, in the major film festivals and, uh, and, uh, and his screenplays um, were sort of issued in uh, books, uh, volumes containing them. Uh, in the United States in translation, and uh, that was an extraordinary thing. You know, one would think that um, uh, filmmakers would have 
have their screenplays uh, published in widely distributed uh, uh, editions uh, issued by trade presses. And that this was the case with Bergman, um, so that he was you know, clearly uh, a force and a figure in, in the culture, certainly in the United States and elsewhere. Um, when, um, when I began teaching film uh, in the mid and late 1960s, um, I found students um, um, much uh, interested in Bergman. And uh, when I lived in New York City in the mid 60s, when I was a graduate student, uh, and then teaching in New York City for several years. Um, when a new Bergman film opened, there, there were lines up the street and around the block waiting to get in uh, for the first run. So, I mean, Bergman really was, uh, in spite of the fact that he was in certain respects demanding and forbidding, um, he was clearly a major figure in, in, in the culture. Um, in some ways, though there were always um, occasional skeptics. Um, and Bergman was, uh, I think, the, uh, the first director to uh, stir uh, American literary academics to think of film as uh, an area they could uh, write about. And, uh, and lots of books began to appear, you know, um, on the subject of, of Bergman's films. But in some ways, I, I would mark as the great uh, sort of breakthrough for Bergman uh, in terms of taking him um, absolutely seriously was an essay, a long essay on Persona uh, by Susan Sontag, uh, which appeared uh, in the Partisan Review. Um, just a short while after the film opened in New York, uh, and that was a you know an essay that was uh, reprinted in her in her book Styles of Radical Will in the late 1960s. And uh, but but if you um, if you go back and, and read the um, the collections of miscellaneous reviews by the leading film critics of the period, uh, Pauline Kael, Stanley Kaufman, John Simon, you find that, that for them, in, in different ways, with, with, uh, with some uh, variation, they, they all took Bergman uh, very seriously. Um, John Simon went on, in fact, to, to write a book about Bergman, uh, quite a good book, actually. And um, so I, I've been interested in Bergman um, really since my early 20s, which means in the early 1960s. And then when I came to Skidmore in the late 60s, um, uh, I, I began teaching uh, January winter term courses on the films of Ingmar Bergman, uh, four weeks in, in which we'd meet uh, five days a week um, uh, to talk about Bergman films. So uh, I, I've been interested in Bergman for a long time, and I've written several essays about Bergman. And Peter, what's your general take on Persona being a great film? I mean, we'll get in more in depth later, but just, just your general take. I, I'm, I'm sorry, Robert. Uh, I, we, we, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Robert. Uh, I was, uh, we, we heard Peter earlier. Robert, uh, what was your take? My, that, that was me, right? That was, that was Robert just talking. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. I, I, I want to just uh, your, your general take of, of, about Persona before we go more in depth. Well, I, 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 you know, uh, I, I can tell you that uh, I was entirely at one uh, with uh, with the results of a uh, uh, of a survey taken of uh, about eighty international film critics um, in the late nineteen seventies by the film magazine Sight and Sound, uh, in which Bergman uh, Bergman's Persona was voted uh, the greatest film ever made, and I. Uh, I, I fully supported that view of persona. Uh, and again, as I say, given that international film poll, uh, whatever value those kinds of things have, one thing they do is they suggest that there is a kind of a consensus. I don't think you'd have anything like the same result if you made such a poll right now uh, in 2021. But uh, I, I do think uh, persona was a breakthrough film for Bergman and a very great film. Yeah. So um, I want to pick up on something that Peter had said when uh, I introduced him. Uh, he had talked about liking and, and sort of loathing Bergman. And for me, Persona is one of those films that uh, is a film that I don't like in an emotional sense, but it's so, it's so technically and uh, ideationally uh, 
daring and, and well executed that you'd be a fool to not say that it's great. And I think a lot of times critics in all the arts mix up what they like with what is good and they, they, they can't separate it. Um, I wanted to, uh, let me start with Peter. Um, is that one of the things that you feel about Persona, that it's a film that emotionally doesn't connect with you, so you don't particularly like it usually, uh, but it, it would be ridiculous to say it's not a great film? <clears throat> <clears throat> no, I don't think that's it. Uh, I mean, I, um, I, I think there are certain things I like about that film, uh -huh. nearly everything. Yeah. But there are a couple of things that I don't like, uh -huh. uh, which prevents it from being a really great film. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, the great thing about it is the formal language, and in, in the way he uses the formal language. Uh, and the, all the technical stuff about cinema and goes through it and to demonstrate the changes in relationships uh, which uh, enriches the, the uh, so-called story between uh, uh, the nurse and the, and the actress. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, there's a complexity in that, uh -huh. which comes not from the event or the storyline, but comes from what he does through the medium of film itself. Then there, and, and that I think is, is interesting. Uh -huh. And I can talk at great length about that. I mean, the, the doubling of characters or doubling of events and uh -huh. things like that, which uh, uh, that's important stuff. Yeah. But then, then there are other things that I don't like. Uh, Bergman was frequently said uh, uh, when he when he started out in Sweden, everybody said, "Oh, brilliant director, brilliant theater director," but he is still in puberty, so to speak. <laughs> he had all these uh, these. Uh, he's concerned about all these problems, you know, God and women and stuff like that, you know. Um, and uh, so he's immature. That's what it was said forever and ever about. Me. Uh -huh. And, you know, I think that now, I'm, well, then I disagreed. I said, Bergman is who he is. But now I'm beginning to see that there is a fundamental immaturity about Bergman, which irritates me. Uh -huh. uh, and he, he, he tends to, um, look, get, let me give you a, a couple of examples. Uh, he, uh, in, a, in a crucial scene, uh, uh, the nurse threatens to throw a pot of boiling water on the actress. Yeah. Well, really you now. How often... <laughs> How often do you have a conversation with somebody and say, I'm going to throw a pot of boiling water on that person? I mean, there, there is a, he drifts into a kind of violence, which I think is kind of immature. Yeah. And there is that kind of immaturity appears both in, in a number of places. Yeah. So when, when the nurse is talking about... Um, her relationship to the actor, all of a sudden she starts, no, 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 yeah. I am not like you. Uh, there is a kind of immaturity which is always there in, in Bergman, uh, which, pre which to me prevents the film from being um, mm, an absolute Massive yeah. Well, it's interesting, Peter, because I was just thinking about the scene. Yeah, you're right. There, there is that melodramatic uh, stretch where she wants to throw the water right. face. But a little bit later, she does that passive aggressive thing where there's a, a some broken glass on the on the on the stoop or, right. uh, when she's coming out, and she and we only hear when uh, Elizabeth steps on it off screen, and you see the little smile. That's to me a much more subtle moment of her vindictiveness. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, let me turn to Robert then. Uh, 
I had mentioned uh, that uh, Persona is a film that I myself don't particularly like, but I think it's a great film. What is your take? Do you both like the film, and do you both do you think it's a great film, Robert? Well, I, yes, I, uh, I I like the film, uh, and uh, I think it's a great film, uh, and um, and uh, yeah, I I I find it um, uh, emotionally overwhelming. Uh, always have. Uh, I teach it every year. Um, uh, I have done so for more than fifty years. And, um, and it seems to me um, emotionally compelling uh, every time I, I see it. Uh, and I find, for the most part, the same response to, to, to persona uh, in my students. Uh-huh. Um, well, and, and, and of course, uh, I think some of the things that, that you've suggested and that Peter has said um, definitely uh, do uh, um, come up in discussions of Bergman. They always have. Uh, but I, I, I don't uh, hear those, those, <clears throat> those uh, words in quite the same way. So then let's take, for example, the word immaturity. Um, you know, the word, the word immaturity, um, when you think about persona, uh, I, I don't think has um, any application whatsoever to Bergman. Um, it's a term I, I, I would apply uh, only to the, act, uh, to, to, uh, to the nurse. Uh, Sister Alma herself. Yeah. Um, we the the figure, the character is established as an immature person right from the very beginning. Um, in her first interview uh, with the psychiatrist uh, before she's um, taken on the job of, of of sort of moving to the island with the actress, um, she says uh, she doesn't think she's strong enough to handle. Uh, a figure like uh, like Elizabeth Vogler. Um and when they're on the island, the nurse talks about herself in a way that sounds uh, charming, uh, naive, uh, okay, immature, um, and and that has to do with uh, with Elizabeth Vogler's sense of her. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there's there's immaturity, but uh, so it's an it's an element of the film. Um, and, and it's very clearly delineated in Bergman's depiction of the character of Sister Alma. And that is the foundation, as far as I'm concerned, for the entire film, um, which is to say, for me, uh, Persona is a film about the, uh, uh, the impact upon uh, a relatively normal, young, immature young woman um, of a much more sophisticated and worldly person uh, like Elizabeth Vogler, um, who is in the grip of an idea, um, a powerful and compelling idea, which um, in effect uh, causes her to, to become mute. Um, and that condition, I, I would say, is uh, as we watch it play out, um, is what imposes itself upon the young, immature Alma and, and turns her into something quite different. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think there's immaturity in the film, but I don't think it has anything to do with Bergman uh, or his take on the action. Uh, Robert, let me uh, start with you. Uh, one final point before we move on to the themes of the film and some of the key scenes. Um, uh, it was mentioned by, I think, Peter was talking about uh, the new wave and Godard. And to me, it seems that uh, Persona is clearly uh, Bergman reacting to the new wave. Um, you know, in Contempt, I think Contempt by Godard opens up with, you hear the, the building of sets too. Uh, it, 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 there's that breaking of the fourth wall. And it seems to me that like I've always felt that when I watch this film, I, Bergman is saying, yeah, you young guys think you can do it? I'm Ingmar Bergman. Watch how it's done. I think that, to me, I think it's almost like Bergman said, I'm the best filmmaker in the world and I'm going to show you. And in a sense, it's almost like him sort of dick waving against the new wave and saying, don't count me out. Um, what, Robert, let me, I'll, I'll go to Peter in a moment. Robert, uh, do you get that sense that Bergman's uh, persona was his, rea- was his reaction to the whole new wave aesthetic that was sweeping film in that time? Well, that, that, that sounds um, in certain ways persuasive, no question. I mean, uh, Persona is 
um, an, uh, an overtly reflexive or self-reflexive film. But I think, you know, it's important to note that uh, Bergman um, had already for a long time, um, even before the advent of the French New Wave, had been making uh, films uh, which had a lot to do with, uh, with the, the filmmaker, the director, the artist, uh, the writer, um, thinking about him or herself and what he does. So, I, I mean, if you think about, well, this, for example, you think about The Magician. Yeah, I, I was just thinking that, yeah. Right, where, where, where you have another character named Vogler, yeah. um, and uh, and there's no question there in my mind, you know, that Bergman was was heading towards something like this. But but of course, what Peter emphasizes, I think, is is very true and very important, which is that uh, th this film is 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 a breakthrough film. This is a film you can really talk about if you want to, uh, in largely formal. Terms and uh, and 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 though um, earlier Bergman films uh, did attract that kind of formalist criticism and analysis, this is the first one that that really um, could could sustain uh, a fully formalist analysis in avant-garde terms. Uh, Peter, what about you? Is this film, do you think, a reaction to the new wave and people like Godard? No, no. no. I think he went his own. He went his own way. If anything, it was the opposite. That the new wave followed him. Huh. Uh, of course, I mean Godard discovered Bergman and wrote about it in the Cahiers de Cinema, and uh, uh, and, and that, that was the beginning of a kind of Bergmania in in uh, France. And uh, uh, so I think that. The, they discovered Bergman for the rest of the world, I think. And uh, uh, so he had, he had no interest in uh, following the new wave. Uh, he, he has talked about how immorally uh, careless people like Antonioni are about where they place the camera and why they place it in certain places and not others. So I think uh, he went his own way and he, for a reason. Uh, I, you know, I wanted to, I appreciate what, what uh, uh, Robert just said about the, the film that can withstand a kind of formalist analysis. And, and I agree absolutely 100% with that. That is to me really important. And let me explain what that means to me. Uh, Bergman, uh, one of the central themes in Bergman is the idea of closeness and distance. Closeness and distance. And that is, in one sense, it is a practical problem. Uh, somebody asks Bergman, how do you decide when to use a close-up and when to use a shot from afar? And Bergman says, well, I wake up in the morning, and if I slept well, and if my tummy feels good, I have a little bit of breakfast, and I charge down and into the room, onto the set, and I said, now, God damn it, we're really going to do it. We're really going to do it, and we're going to uh, we could take a long scene, a long close-up, and we could get really close to the faces and so forth. And then he says, other days you wake up and uh, you feel shitty and you, are, you feel bad and you, you come down, down, downstairs and everybody's asking, where do you want the camera and where do you want the light and how are we going to do this? And he says, Go away, go away, I don't want to talk to you. You're, you're giving me problems all the time. And at that point he says, I move the camera as far away from the action as I can. Mm. I think that that is funny. Yeah. That is funny because he, he makes the formal, formal appearance of the film uh, to come out of, it comes out of the way he feels when he wakes up in the morning. 
I don't believe for a moment that this is true. Yeah. But it is, of course, a, a way of Bergman to articulate that what this, he has two conflicting desires always in everything he does. And that is, I want to get close to the action, close to the actors, close to what's really going on, what's really bothering them. And at that, then when he gets really close, he suddenly says, I don't want to be there. I don't want to be there. It's nasty. Take the double scene, the, the kind of monologue which uh, uh, Alma yeah. speaks twice, right? Yeah. Well, that, that it's a way of getting closer to each other. And when they do, finally, uh, the nurse breaks out and says, no, 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 I'm not you. I am not you. And uh, th so that the closeness breaks the relationship. Well, uh, at that point, you know, what interests me is that what is a formal, what starts out as a formal dilemma, close up or long shot or whatever, that ceases being simply a formal problem and becomes an event in the development of the film itself, in the action of the film itself. Same thing is true of um, Cries and Whispers, where he said, so you cannot separate the formal features of the film from uh, the story that's being told, the relationship between the nurse and the actress, and so forth. So I, I find this interesting. Uh, who else does? Who else uses the media in that particular way? Yeah. I don't know of anybody. Yeah. So uh, before I, I get to talk about uh, uh, the actual film and some of the scenes and uh, themes, uh, it's interesting, uh, Peter, that you mentioned uh, Antonioni because I always, I've always thought that these were two film directors that were dealing with in their films the very same topics. The only difference was that Bergman used a microscope into the human condition and Antonioni would use a telescope. Uh, and uh, so it's interesting because, and you know, they obviously are sort of entwined because they died on the same day back 13 years ago. So uh, I've always found that interesting. But um, let me start uh, with you, uh, Robert. Um, and let's talk about the opening of the film, the bravura opening with uh, the young boy who was also in uh, uh, The Silence uh, and, you know, the, the spider crawling and the, the, the touching of the screen and whatnot. And we get the, you know, the old silent film footage and uh, a lot of other things about pain and the, the, the hand, you know, the, the, the spike being driven into the hand and all that stuff. Uh, 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 Robert, if you could talk to me a little bit about how that sets up some of the themes of the film. Well, sure. Um, I think, uh, first of all, the, op the opening of the film very clearly announces um, that, that uh, in, at least in some respects, uh, this is intended as uh, a formalist work. Um, it, it's impossible to, to sit through that opening sequence and, and not to feel that. Um, and so you, you don't know exactly what that means um, and, and how the formalist elements are going to be used and, and how they're going to relate to uh, the features of the narrative. As the narrative unfolds, you assume there will be some sort of unfolding of a narrative uh, beyond that opening sequence, but of course you can't begin to anticipate what that will be. Um, and of course the only, the only way you, you sort of can begin to surmise that there will be connection to a narrative is at the very tail end uh, of that opening sequence. When we move through uh, what appears to be a morgue uh, and we see a variety of figures uh, laid out on slabs, um, uh, at one moment there's some odd uh, things that happen when, uh, when the eyes of, of, of one of the uh, corpses opens in response to the ringing of a bell or a telephone. Um, but but really, um, you, you, Bergman um, brings that whole sequence to a close when he turns to the young boy. 
Um, and there you have a young boy who would seem, at least initially, to be um, like one of the corpses uh, on one of those mortuary slabs. Um, and you remember that the boy is covered up um, in a sheet, right? Uh, covered with a white sheet, yeah. um, which he begins to uh, become restless under. Um, he kicks it off, um, eventually he puts on some glasses and he sits up. And, uh, and by the time that sequence is brought to a close, the boy is reaching forward towards us which is to say towards a kind of a screen. And on the screen, we have the two very large uh, sort of faces uh, of Alma and Elizabeth, which are uh, juxtaposed, intermixed, um, and so on, as the boy sort of draws them on the screen or reaches towards them on the screen. And that uh, sort of, in effect, takes us into the, the narrative uh, of the film, the body of the film. Yeah. So there's no question that, uh, again, that opening sequence is, on the one hand, an announcement of a certain kind of film, and at the same time, a preface or a prelude um, to the narrative. Now, exactly what you want to do with the uh, separate images uh, in that opening sequence um, well, is, is I, I think, uh, a matter for discussion or even debate, uh, because they are of several different kinds. Uh, the images are of several different kinds, right? Um, uh, there's, there's a little uh, clip um, uh, of, of Popeye the Sailor Man. Uh, there is a nail being uh, hammered into a hand. Um, so it seemed to be a repertoire of diverse images, which might or might not be drawn upon, called up, um, if you were attempting to represent uh, certain states of mind, certain states of feeling, um, images, many of them from what you might call the repertoire of uh, sort of archetypes in the culture. Um, and, and so Bergman is just sort of setting those out there. Um, and, and reminding us that there are various sort of standard or staple ways of representing uh, experiences um, in art. And, and, and these are some of the ways. Um, there is no question, in my mind at least, that he doesn't want us to think too much about each of those images because um, he presents them in rapid succession in such a way that the uh, film goer um, uh, who was sort of sitting in the theater uh, in 1965 or 66 looking at the, at the film would have a hard time sort of taking them all in and holding them in the mind. They succeed one another so quickly. Um, ne nevertheless, again, you, you have this impression that there is uh, right, an, an announcement that this is to be a certain kind of film and you have a sense too that Bergman wants that sequence to evolve into something that will link up with the main narrative. And that's, that's what he does as he moves through the mortuary sequence and, and leaves us with the little boy. Okay. So anyway, that, that's, that's an initial answer to your question. Okay. Let me, uh, Peter, uh, do you have anything to add uh, your take on the opening? <clears throat> No, I'm less enamored of these days, but uh, but uh, no, I think that Robert presents it quite correctly. Uh, it states some major themes, yeah. obviously, yeah. and uh, it doesn't matter how carefully you read them; yeah. they're there, yeah. and you remember them when the time comes. Uh, so, Robert, you had talked about uh, the setup of uh, Alma. Uh, and her, uh, her, you know, her uh, being said, talked about uh, Elizabeth, uh, she, she's she gone mute. She's uh, Alma's then, I guess, dispatched off to the island where Elizabeth, I guess, is uh, summering. Uh, um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the two main characters here, Alma and Elizabeth. Um, uh, the A lot of critics, especially here in the U.S., try to state that uh, the two characters are two halves or a whole or they're one woman. To me, I've, I've just never... I think that's ridiculous. I mean, they're, they're clearly set, stated, uh, they're shown as separate individual characters. 
Um, so uh, what's your take on uh, the two main characters uh, as they're initially presented? Uh, is that is that for me? Uh, no, uh, I'll go with Peter first, then then I'll follow yeah, up with yeah, you, Robert. Good, yeah. Yeah, well, I, no, I think, well, of course, they're two the, totally separate characters. And the whole problem is exactly that. They are, they're trying to speak to each other or they're trying to uh, reach each other somehow. The nurse is envious of the, uh, of the actress and said, I wish I could be like you. I couldn't conceivably. You're so big, you're so famous, you're so beautiful, you're all these things. And, uh, and, but the, the uh, actress, of course, is the opposite. She is uh, uh, dissatisfied with her life because she thinks that it's a lie and it's fake. And that the, the life that she leads on the stage is is in fact the same life that she leads in her life and she wants out of it. And the only way she can do, so is, do that is by um, uh, refusing to speak. Uh, so you have the, 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 uh, uh, it's the relationship between the two of them states one of the central themes in the film. Is it possible? to be absolutely truthful. How can one speak the truth? And uh, uh, and that uh, there are so many confessions of various kinds in this film. Uh, I mean, the most famous one is the, is the one that occurs when Alma tells about her erotic encounter on the beach. Yeah. And one of the interesting things about that is, is how it's filmed. That uh, Alma talks and talks, and uh, she seemingly can't stop. And then occasionally, the camera moves away from her and moves into onto the face of, or onto uh, an image of Lee Ullman with her. I think her back against the wall, sitting back, smoking and listening to the story, but not saying anything. The really interesting thing is that we know at that moment that Alma, that, that sorry, Elizabeth is saying, what she's thinking is, tell me more. I want to hear more. And that is it. So, <clears throat> normally one would expect, in fact, yeah, and what happened then, and stuff like that. Bergman does not do that. What he does is keeps the camera far away, pointed towards Elizabeth, and lets uh, and waits for her. All that Eliz Elizabeth feels is portrayed in her face, in her listening. That's kind of extraordinary. Because that suggests that the, the relationship between the two of them is in fact highly ambivalent. And uh, um, so, um, yeah, I think uh, this, um, I don't know how I got onto that, but <laughs> they, they are clearly two distinct figures. Okay. And uh, they, they try to get closer, and the double monologue is the typical example of that. Mm -hmm. And that, as they become really closer and closer, what was hoped for in that initial confession, Alma withdraws in horror and says, no, I am not like you. I am not you. I am a separate separate person and uh, um, this is um, and this is a crucial moment in the film uh, Robert let me pick up with you uh, what is your take on the two main characters 
And also, there, there's a scene where, where we're getting uh, the letter being read about Elizabeth that she had had a son. And some people have speculated that the young boy in the beginning with the glasses is uh, uh, Elizabeth's son. What, what's your take on those two characters and, and that uh, particular angle about the Elizabeth's son? Well, let me, let me start with this with, with the question about the son, since that's the that's the most so focused and concentrated part, and then I, I could branch okay. out from there. Um, well, it seems to me that that we can't answer uh, with with any uh, kind of conviction uh, as to whether the boy uh, in the beginning of the film in the mortuary and so on is uh, is or is not uh, this this child or that child. What we do know is uh, that. The question of the uh, the women's relationship to children um, is an issue in the film, um, since it has to do with uh, some constitutive sense that they have about who they are, what they are, what they are meant to be. Uh, we know, for example, that uh, at one point uh, uh, in the film, uh, Elizabeth uh, tears up the photograph of her own child. Mm -hmm. We know that. We know that um, in the confession that Peter just spoke about, um, uh, Alma uh, talks about uh, the uh, sort of erotic encounter on the beach and the fact that there was an abortion. Uh, so we have, we know, uh, children, um, one of them associated with, uh, with the actress, one of them uh, an aborted child uh, associated with Alma. So, uh, so that's there. And that would account for, in some way, uh, the boy in the mortuary reaching up uh, to the screen and drawing the, uh, the faces of the two women uh, as, he reaches, um, as he reaches forward. And, and what does that mean? Well, I, I don't know for sure what it means. It suggests if you think of that as belonging to a kind of a dream that Alma has, uh, it would have to do with a, a sort of a guilt dream in which, and this is where I, I begin to enter the larger question that, that you just posed, a guilt dream in which Alma sort of takes upon herself guilt for, for her own uh, abortion and at the same time guilt for what has happened uh, to Elizabeth, which seems bizarre, um, uh, but we have to remember that uh, Alma is a very... Uh, as Peter had put it earlier, a very immature, naive young person who has a job. She takes her job very seriously. Her job is to restore um, her patient, uh, Elizabeth, to what she at least, Alma, takes to be some semblance of sanity, normality, which would in that case be a return to work and a return to her husband. So. Uh, so that, that's, in, in effect, uh, the setup. Um, now, if you think about uh, the words that Peter uh, cited, um, I'm not you, I'm not like you, um, words spoken by Alma to Elizabeth, um, in some ways it seems to me that that, that is the core, uh, as Peter suggests, of the entire film. Um, I think that's, that's what the narrative is, is um, uh, all about. So how is that what the narrative is all about? Well, in effect, uh, Alma remains a young woman who, um, who believes in health, sanity. <laughs> she says things, she says things that are uh, entirely of a piece with that uh, notion that the way to live is to live in the ordinary way, to do a good job, to uh, to serve, to spend 50 years and get a, a watch at the end of the 50 years for devoted and loyal service, right? That's the kind of thing that, uh, that Alma uh, talks about. And um, in the course of the film, um, she is struck by Elizabeth's unwillingness to be um, normal. I'm putting these words in quotation marks. Elizabeth's unwillingness to be normal, healthy, friendly, warm, confiding, to speak. When Alma says, I need you to speak, to say something, just do it, 
as a favor to me, say something, right? That uh, I, I think expresses, you know, Alma's desperate um, sense that, um, that, that Elizabeth refuses to come around to what she needs her to be. That sense of it, I would say, culminates in, um, in the visit to the island of uh, a man who is ostensibly um, the husband of Elizabeth Vogler, mm. right? I mean, you, you remember, uh, he, he comes to the island, and um, as you think about that sequence, um, it, it, initially at least, it's not strange at all. Suddenly this man appears, um, he has dark glasses, uh, and uh, he addresses Alma initially, not as his wife, um, but asks for his wife, for Elizabeth. And uh, as the sequence evolves, uh, he begins um, to relate to Alma as if she were Elizabeth. And if you recall, Elizabeth's face on the screen is there, yeah. uh, basically urging Alma to progress, to proceed as if she were, um, as if she were Elizabeth. And eventually, Elizabeth submits to the husband, yeah. who has a great feeling for his wife. He says, and he senses that he is uh, uh, sleeping with his wife. And she tells him what a wonderful lover he is. All of the various things, in other words, that um, in good stereotypical terms, uh, a normal wife would do for her husband. She would come to him. She would yield to him. She would tell him what a wonderful lover he is. She would go on with this until finally, as she does that, um, with Elizabeth there, or urging her on, Alma um, breaks from this pose and says, I can't, I won't, it is all a lie. <clears throat> so in effect, all of the various things that Alma has said to the effect that I'm not you, I'm not like you, right? Um, all of those things are in effect, in effect contradicted uh, by what's happened to Alma. She has been, let me use this word, infected um, by um, her intimacy with Elizabeth. She has come to feel this young, immature, naive, good-hearted person, a nurse, right, committed to sanity and normality. She has come to feel what an effect Elizabeth um, has been uh, insisting upon yeah. by her muteness that it is all a lie. Language is a lie. Normality is a lie, yes. right? Um, and, and so it seems to me that that is the essential sort of dynamic that drives the narrative and explains much that goes on in the film. Well, Robert, let me just ask you this, and then I'll, I'll go to Peter. Uh, since you, you you bring up the ending uh, towards the end, where uh, Gunnar Bjornstrand, who, who plays uh, Mr. Vogler, uh, Elizabeth's husband, uh, shows up, it seems to me, and I think most people interpret it that as something that's going on in the mind of Elizabeth, because you know she's looking towards the camera and they're sort of on her shoulder in the in the background, uh, and yet that comes after most of the film, where it seems. To me, and also a lot of critics have said, Elizabeth seems to be very, she's almost like the villain of the film in the sense that she's like a psychic vampire. You know, there's that, that famous scene with the curtains blowing in and she comes in and she seems to be playing this game where she's, you know, why is she she mute? Is she using her, her, her supposed muteness as a way to torture the nurse in some way to draw her out? And then it seems almost as if then with the scene with Gunna Bjornstrand as the husband, that her character is maybe uh, regretting that and maybe imagining this with Alma. Do, do you, do, what is your take on, do you think Elizabeth is, is the, the prime driver or the villain of the piece in a sense? No, I don't think so. No. I, I, I don't think so at all. I mean, first of all, um, what happens to Elizabeth, uh, this, this of course is, is one of the only things we can say with absolute conviction uh, about this film, because there are many things, you know, we, we can speculate about. That's what we're doing, in effect, as, to, as we talk about it. Um, one thing we know for sure 
and, and, and that is that Elizabeth Mutinous, at least initially, has nothing to do with Alma. Um, and, uh, and it is, as it were, explained um, uh, by the psychiatrist in the early encounter uh, before we go to the island um, as a, a phase uh, that, that the actress has to go through, something that she feels she has to play out, which she will now be permitted to play out in the company of this lovely young person, Sister Alma. So, no, I don't think there's anything particularly uh, cruel or mean-spirited uh, in the determination of the actress uh, to go mute. And I certainly don't think uh, that it has anything to do with a, a desire to uh, hurt um, the, uh, the nurse. I, I take the words uh, in Elizabeth's letter, uh, which Alma reads, uh, to be quite um, plausible and compelling. This is a version she says in the letter. This is a rather lovely and naive young person. I think she's sort of falling in love with me. Uh, that sounds right. Um, and it's supported by various things that we see Alma saying. So, so, so that, that's one part of my answer. The other one I make much shorter, and that is, um, the, the visit of the, uh, of the husband to the island, um, for me, uh, at least, has to be not Elizabeth's dream. It makes no sense to me at all as Elizabeth's dream. It's Alma's dream. Okay. It's the wish fulfillment dream in which Alma imagines um, what, uh, would, um, uh, what would happen if Elizabeth were to become suddenly uh, the docile obedient patient and do what Alma wants her to do, which is to come around uh, and, uh, and, and, for example, go back to her husband and her life and her child and do the right thing. Um, and and that, that's the wish fulfillment dream that Alma has. And of course, in having it, particularly because it has an erotic element, um, obviously an erotic element, um, she needs, Alma needs, um, Elizabeth to, as it were, give her permission to play out uh, this scenario. And, and that's why Elizabeth has to be there on the screen. Otherwise, uh, Alma would not permit herself um, to yield to this wish fulfillment. Uh, Peter, uh, if Elizabeth is not, say, the villain of the piece, do you think she is the prime driver of the action of the film? Mm. Uh, well, no. Uh, <clears throat> oh, Elizabeth, maybe she drives to action, but uh, everybody suffers from the same problem, which is to say, why is it that when I try to be truthful, uh, it becomes a role that I play and it becomes fake, and it becomes... Uh, so, uh, it is a... Uh, um, um, when Alma says, uh, I wish I could be absolutely truthful, but why does it become something else as soon as I start looking for it? She, she talks about uh, um, that there's something fake about, about everything. Both of them have the experience that language is not adequate for them. And uh, um, so you, you, you speak, you end up, speaking the kind of things that are suitable for yourself, for yourself. And if you're silence, you drive the action in the, by your very silence. So uh, that is the problem. That is the problem. Uh, if you're consumed by the fact that the world is filled with lies, uh, if you speak, you uh, you get nowhere. And if you shut up, you get nowhere. 
So that is the dilemma uh, that people have in the film. And uh, um, I think, uh, I like what uh, uh, Robert says, that uh, she's been infected. Yeah, she comes to realize that she has been become infected. She is suffering from the same problem that uh, Elizabeth is suffering from. Uh, uh, and uh, that leads to another a question that I have. Um, I see the film moving towards a kind of confrontation, an attempt to force a solution. And what I want to know myself, and I maybe Robert could illuminate me on this, what is the, has anything been changed by the conclusion of the film? Uh, that is to say, is there a real tra transformation possible in the film? Because I think in the end, uh, in the end, as the as the psychiatrist has has uh, uh, predicted, Elizabeth comes to see that yeah, this is just another role I've been playing. I'm bored. I'll go back to the theater. The lies of the theater are better than ordinary lies, and. Uh, and Alma does what a good nurse does. She <clears throat> she packs up the house and puts it away, and then she goes goes home by a sturdy rural bus. And uh, has anything changed? Is there any kind of conclusion? Is there any kind of is there anything we have learned? Is there or is it a recognition? that the world is filled with lies and deceptions and uh, uh, this is the world that we live in. Uh, I, um, I don't know my, myself. I, I, I tend to believe that that is what the film is actually saying, that the film is a, is a film that uh, um, says that this is the way that the world is. Um, Robert, do you want to? Uh, yeah, Robert, do you want to try to answer Peter's question? Well, I, 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 you know, I, I agree pretty much with everything that Peter just said uh, so so eloquently. Um, the only thing I would add, really, um, I, th I think it's a it's a small thing, but I, I think it's significant, um, and that is um, when uh, Alma does, as Peter says, uh, the thing that uh, that. Uh, the dutiful uh, sort of nurse in charge of the situation is supposed to do by uh, packing up the house and folding up the blankets and doing all of the things that need doing. Um, uh, she then um, puts on her coat and she walks to the mirror. Um, and uh, as she walks to the mirror, she puts the little nurse's cap uh, on her head, and as she does so, Elizabeth's face appears at her shoulder, uh, and she sees it in the mirror as she straightens the hat yeah. on her head. Now, that seems to me to suggest that something has happened that, yes, the nurse will go back um, to her life, but she will not be the same Sister Alma she has been. I can't say more than that. Um, she, she will be a person who will be forever, if we can use you know, a term like forever, who will ever be sort of haunted by the example uh, of Elizabeth Vogler and her muteness. Um, that, that has been achieved. And I think it's fair to say, uh, given Alma's uh, immaturity and naivete and her Pollyannish uh, attitudes towards things, that's a good thing. 
um, uh, even even if Elizabeth Vogler was only sort of temporarily playing another role, right? Um, I think Alma, in some way, is more affected by the playing of that role in a more profound and meaningful way. So I take it that this is a kind of a, um, uh, I, maybe this is use the wrong term, but a, a kind of a coming of age experience for Alma, that Alma grows. Uh, we, can't, we can't see that played out um, in, in the film because the film ends at that point, but the suggestion is there. Then the one other thing we see is that when Alma goes out to take that, uh, that bus, uh, that, that Peter uh, referred to, uh, we also see that right out there um, uh, is, uh, is Bergman um, seated out with the camera. Um, and so uh, again, we have a reminder that um, the unfolding of this drama is an aspect of the unfolding of a certain conflict in the filmmaker himself. Um, and so what is all of this good for? Well, it's, it's good for the making of a masterpiece film. Um, it's good for the reminder that art can encompass these conflicts in a way that sort of maintains the enigma. Um, uh, and and I, think that's, I think that's what Bergman wants us to feel. Uh, so I want to uh, end up about the film, just uh, talking a little bit about uh, the ending and then uh, uh, final uh, uh, opinions about the film. Um, my favorite film of Bergman is Winter Light. I think it's a, a great dialogue of self and soul. And in a sense, this is also kind of a dialogue of self and soul, uh, uh, especially for the Alma character. Uh, but I'm wondering with the ending, uh, where, where we see, uh, I think it's Alma walking away, and we, we see and hear the sounds of the crew filming her. Uh, in two or three other Bergman films, there's... Uh, marionette shows. There are sort of Punch and Judy shows. And I'm wondering if at the end of this film, uh, we have seen the ultimate Punch and Judy film, that Elizabeth and Alma are really just, you know, it, they turn out to just be characters, not necessarily real people, if we're to believe that this is a, a film being made within a film. Um, so let me ask you, Peter, uh, uh, do you think that the persona is the ultimate Bergman Punch and Judy film? And you said you didn't think it was a great film, but why should should people uh, still seek it out and see it? No, I think I think it's it's a great film, but uh, uh, you know the ending is strange um, uh, to me. Um, what really happens? This is it's funny to consider that. In the script, the first version of the script, Alma is uh, uh, looking in the mirror, and then the, the the image in the mirror is taken over by a close-up of a furious, angry, violent shot of of um, of uh, Elizabeth that takes over the image. And uh, well, yeah, that's one way. It, why did he not shoot that? Or why did he decide for the ending that he finally did? Well, I don't, I don't know uh, that, but I don't know what to make of it. I don't know how serious to take it. What bothers me about um, uh, Robert's uh, um, reading of it is that, is that uh, uh, it becomes a kind of, uh, forgive me for uh, saying that, but a kind of goody goody ending, okay, that, in fact, we've learned something from this. Um, well, do we all have to learn in that particular way? And to say that this has been a learning experience is to me to cheapen the film. That's not a learning experience. It's, uh, it's something else going on there, and uh, uh, which is much more serious, much more serious, which is that the, the intent the attempt to live a life searching for truth can become a destructive enterprise. If true, if you love the truth so much that you must pursue it in this particular way, then people can be damaged by it. Look at the ending in, of um, uh, 
the Passion of Anna, where Max von Sydow is walking back and forth there until the film literally dissolves in front of that disintegrates in front of our eyes. Mm. So I, I think that the Bergman consistently avoids making positive solutions. And I think that the ending of, of this particular film is that, no, there are no positive solutions. There are, uh, there are dilemmas and problems that will continue to be there. And uh, um, Alma is not going, what's going to happen to Alma? Is that relevant? What's going to happen to Elizabeth? Is that relevant? Have they had an experience that's going to bring them closer to each other, closer to their husbands, closer speculation? And they don't bring me closer to the film itself. The film itself is in the way that Alma speaks to Elizabeth and Elizabeth speaks to her. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, it's, uh, uh, I don't know what to, what to, what to make of it. Uh, but I, I find it compelling, in fact. A film that does not respond in the way that I would like it to. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, Bergman knew exactly what he was doing. So. Well, uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, let me just turn to you then, Robert. Uh, um, uh, a couple of things that I didn't even mention in the film. There's the famous sort of snap of the film, the, the fake sort of as if the film... Uh, the stock had snapped, and then there's, of, of course, the double face, half Alma, half uh, Elizabeth. Uh, d so let me just ask you the final qu two questions that I uh, posed to Peter. Uh, are Elizabeth and Alma, you know, a Bergman Punch and Judy show in that they're just characters and he's playing with human marionettes? And what is your final uh, say on the, the greatness of the film? Well, yeah, I, you know, uh, I, I can't think of them as... Uh, as marionettes, uh, figures, uh, they're too raw and, and, and humanly present uh, for me as I watch the film to think of them uh, in that way. I, I don't think of them at all that way. Um, they do seem to me to uh, respond to their situation and to one another in, uh, in the way that human beings might conceivably do. Um, if they were disposed to behave the way Alma, on the one hand, is disposed and, and the way Elizabeth, on the other hand, is disposed to behave. So, no, I think of them as uh, what I would call fully embodied characters uh, uh, and not as uh, marionettes, not as puppet figures that with whom Bergman can do uh, any frivolous thing he chooses to do. So, no, I, I, I don't uh, accept that at all. Um, and, uh, and I do think, again, I want to come back to this notion that, that uh, Peter was talking about, about the, the film as a learning experience. Uh, again, I would make the distinction here. Um, I don't think of the film as a learning experience. I think that it's Alma who has, and again, the term, I agree with Peter, the term a learning experience is soft. It suggests, you know, a kind of a sentimentality on, on Bergman's part. And, and I agree with Peter when he says, no, it's, it's, it's much more serious than that. But in fact, um, if you think of what happens to Alma in the way that I just sort of tried to describe it a few minutes ago, I think she does have a kind of uh, a learning experience. It's a terrifying learning experience because what it has done um, is to undermine um, her conviction that the world is a safe and easy place, occasionally uh, sort of interrupted by um, a terrible uh, anomalous events, which you should be able to get past, and a, a terrible anomalous event like the erotic encounter she describes uh, on the beach. But otherwise, again, if you, if you think about the way she talks about herself and her ambitions and her marriage, um, you see that, that she has an entirely complacent view uh, of human experience. And 
so I would say she's shaken um, in, uh, in the course of the film. And the presence of Elizabeth there at her shoulder um, in that final image of her in the mirror, looking in the mirror, uh, is a reminder to her um, and to us that she will never be the same. Uh, so that, yeah, that's a kind of a learning experience, but it's not a nice, uh, easy, sweet learning experience by any means. Um, so uh, I sorry, and I do uh, sort of agree with, with, with Peter when he says that what you take from all of this is yes, very much. There are no positive solutions. Um, there are no positive solutions in any Bergman film, and certainly not in, in this, not even in the comedies. Uh, of Bergman are their positive solutions. Um, uh, and, and so I, 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 I did think this film is, uh, in its ending and throughout, entirely rigorous. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that's, I think that's what we want it to be. And uh, Robert, what do you take of, of the, the ending? Is it, is it a film within a film? And what does that say about what we have seen? Is this sort of a document? Are the characters within the film part of a documentary, or are they characters within characters? Well, again, I, I think I think the film invites us to think of all of this uh, in several ways. On the one hand, uh, you know, it's a narrative, um, and it's a narrative with characters and a setting and a kind of a plot, right? Uh, and it's easy to to name the plot, and that's and on the other hand. Um, it is a formalist work um, which um, raises very demanding questions about the capacity of the imagination to encompass um, the kinds of things that are depicted in the narrative. Um, when the film uh, splits and, and, and burns and so on, um, in the middle of the film, in the middle of the narrative, uh, when... Uh, Alma has left out the piece of glass for Elizabeth to uh, step onto and cut her foot on. Um, I, th I think that is registering in some ways both the emotions of the two characters inside the narrative and also um, it is the response of the film. Um, how can film fully accommodate, fully register that kind of betrayal? Um, anger, vengefulness, how, how does a film do that? And I think Bergman finds sort of the most elegant, formal way to express that. Well, I want to thank both of you uh, for talking about Persona. I'll link to both of your uh, university web pages. Uh, and uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you. So thank you for doing it. You're welcome. We enjoyed it. You're welcome. Thank you. Very enjoyable.